welcome to another Zoom edition of the Purple Knights podcast. Whether you're watching this video on YouTube or listening on Blog Talk Radio or Apple Podcasts, thank you very much for uh, your listening or viewing. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Today I'm joined by a very special guest, a uh, an author, a radio host, a podcaster, a freelance music journalist. She's well known in the Prince fan community. I'd like to welcome Andrea Swenson to the Purple Nights podcast. Thank you hey, for being Chris. here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. Well, uh, yeah, I'm very excited too. I've been waiting for this for a few weeks and uh, it should be an exciting discussion. Uh, I'm really uh, excited to talk to you. I've been getting very good guests on the podcast as of late. So I'm very fortunate in that respect. And you're, uh, you're just one in several that I've gotten lately that I've been really honored and really excited to talk to. So it's really gratifying for me to have such wonderful guests on my small little podcast. So thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to uh, get started, tell us a little bit about how you started in journalism and radio. Sure. Um, yeah, it's been quite a few years now. So I really got serious about becoming a music critic in 2005. Um, I started blogging for myself and for some of my friends' websites, totally volunteer just for the love of it um, to get started. And I did that for a few years and freelanced. And then my first full-time job was uh, City Pages, the Alt Weekly in Minneapolis, which sadly we just lost uh, in the last year. And that was really jumping into the deep end of the pool and learning everything about music journalism. You know, I was managing a team of writers and photographers and writing myself and running the whole print section and blog and everything music related that they did. Um, so I did that for four years and then I've been at NPR for the last decade and started there as a writer and blogger and gradually moved over to the on-air side and really kind of fell in love with radio and making audio and realizing how similar it is to the work that I had been doing in writing but that there's just something that you get out of hearing someone and now seeing someone, you know, now that we do these Zoom interviews, talking about their work. Um, it's just captivating to me. So I've gotten very into audio, um, podcasting, as you mentioned, and um, I'm going to be continuing to do that now that I have left the current uh, Minnesota Public Radio's The Current. Uh, I left in early April to start my own freelance business. So um, I'm really excited to be writing all kinds of different things, articles, more books, um, and then also working on some podcasts. Very, very great. And speaking of your books, you mentioned about four, it's been about four years now since it originally came out in hardcover, but your history of uh, black music and soul music in Minneapolis got to be something here. History of the Minneapolis Sound came out about four years ago in hardcover, and it recently came out in paperback with a brand new forward by uh, not other than Jelly Bean Johnson, the original drummer for Morris Day at the time. So tell us, tell me a little bit about uh, researching and writing for for that project, and then also leading into the the recent publication in paperback with the new Ford and everything. How did that yeah. how did that all come about? So I started working on that book eight years ago now. I spent four years on it. And um it really all started because of this compilation that came out in the Twin Cities. It was a compilation of 
long lost funk and soul 45s that got reissued on this one great LP uh, called Twin Cities Funk and Soul by the label Secret Stash. And as they were getting ready to put this record out, they had a release show planned where a lot of these artists were going to come and be showcased. And they invited me to come to the rehearsal for the release show. And I will never forget this night because it left such a strong impression on me. But that was the first time I met Wee Willie Walker, the Valdons, um, members of Prophets of Peace. Wilbur Cole was there from Band of Thieves and many other projects. And I was just so struck by the fact that there were so many talented musicians who are still active and still able to perform that the scene has ignored and really erased from the history that we talk about when we talk about Minnesota music history. Nothing against the band The Trashmen that came out in the 60s from Minneapolis, but that's like the only act that people seem to really have canonized in that way from the Twin Cities. They were this garage band with a kind of one-hit wonder, a uh, surf and bird single. And it just made me both embarrassed because I was already so many years into my career and I wasn't familiar with these artists and also really upset that we as a community hadn't done the work to really canonize them in, in the same way as their white peers. So that really got me going. I remember saying that night, someone's got to write a book about this. I didn't know it was going to be me, but it was just, it hit me like this history was hanging in the air over all of these artists. So I started scheduling some interviews and sitting down for often hours at a time with these artists and really listening to their full life stories and recording them and writing everything down. And, and then I did a lot of archival research in the libraries. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the microfilm room, looking at old newspaper clippings and that kind of thing, looking for ads for some of these long lost clubs and that, that kind of stuff. And then um, digging through their own archives of scrapbooks and photographs and trying to piece together this larger history of what scene they were a part of. And as I started doing that, I realized that in order to get to this question of why don't we know these names, why aren't they celebrated in the, in the way that they need to be, I had to also get into the roots of racism and segregation and discrimination in the Twin Cities because the Black community has been just at every turn marginalized and erased and disadvantaged and our scene to this day, our music scene is very segregated in Minnesota. It's very rare outside of Prince related events to find a mixed audience at a concert, which is just so sad. Um, so that's kind of a, a long rambling answer, but that's, that's where my curiosity began. And then it just kept blooming from there as I learned more and realized that it needed to be this larger social history in addition to a music history and how to, you know, weave all of that together. Right, and it's interesting reading the uh, introduction for the book. I've, I've read quite a bit of the book, but I, as I said before, before we officially started the podcast, unfortunately, I haven't been able to uh, finish the whole book uh, prior to today. So I still have a few chapters left to read. I think I... I think I uh, I read through the chapter on Willie and the Bumblebees, so that's where I am right now. Um, so I have several chapters left, but it's just a, a great book. And reading the introduction, you know, about the racial tension that's always always existed in Minneapolis, and especially the downtown area and the music scenes and the, all the, the clubs and stuff that, that were briefly around in the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s that were closed down for one reason or another, um, especially the club that stood out in my mind when I was reading the book is King Solomon's Mines. And uh, I was born in 1980, so that's a little, a little before my time, but reading about it and, and seeing the pictures, you know, from the the family of Dean Constantine, the owner, um, 
I was really struck by, you know, what the atmosphere must have been like in that club and how special it was for people and patrons to go there and also for bands to to play there. So what an iconic location that sort of, uh, if not for this book, would have been sort of obscured or worst case scenario lost in the annals of history. So this is a very important historical book that you've done and it just keeps hitting me over and over reading it. And I'm so glad that people are doing the work to preserve you know, these important memories of these important eras and important locations and important people that were around, you know, back in the day, because it is very important to the development and the history of what would become the Minneapolis Sound, you know, of course, brought to the global stage by, you know, Prince and more stay in the time and groups like that, but we all have to start somewhere. And the book actually starts in 1958, which coincidentally is the year of Prince's birth. But right. uh, yeah, and I thought that was really, really significant as well. And really sort of serendipitous in a way, but it's really great to read about the history and the culture of Minneapolis soul music. So I really, really enjoyed the book. And how did the how did the paperback version, the recent paperback version, come together with the new forward by Jelly Bean Johnson? Yeah, well, you know, since publishing the book, I of course have learned so much more that I wish I could include. Um, I, there was a, a brief conversation with my editor about doing an expanded reissue of the book where I would be able to build on the new information and new interviews that I've done in the last four years. We decided to keep the book as it is. I think in my future work, those interviews will definitely appear. Um, but this book is, it, it, I had it framed around a very specific period of time on purpose. Um, 1958 being, you know, the year the first R&B 45 was recorded in Minnesota and Prince was born. And then 1981 being the year that Prince played First Avenue for the first time, which was a huge moment, not just for him, but actually for the music scene to have a black artist headlining the First Avenue stage, then known as Sam's, after so many years of black artists systematically being kept out of downtown altogether. Um, that just felt like the perfect moment to stop and where so much other print scholarship picks up. I didn't need to keep going because there's just been so much amazing work done about, you know, Prince's career once he was fully established. So I didn't want to open that Pandora's box and say, let's just start adding to this book because I honestly, I think I could work on it for another decade and still not feel like it's complete. So we decided to keep the book intact the way I wrote it, but I absolutely love Jelly Bean and have gotten to know him better over the last few years. And I've interviewed him for the Prince podcast about 1999 and met him and gone to, you know, show, gone and seen him play at the um, Minnesota Music Cafe several times now. And, and he's just such a delight. And the way that he tells stories about that time is so uniquely him. And I just wanted his voice to be included so badly. So when I had the opportunity to put out the paperback, I knew right away that I wanted him involved. And we went about it in a, in a um, somewhat non-traditional way. Instead of having him just sit down and start writing, we actually had a series of conversations where we were going through his memories and what he wanted to draw out and, and have included. And then I actually took the transcripts of him speaking and shaped it into the essay collaboratively with him that you see in the book. So it really is a, just a story hour <laughs> with Jelly Bean as he's sitting down and opening up his memory and thinking about this time and also thinking about, you know, what it means now in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the most recent uprising in Minneapolis to learn about this history, um, the social history of the Twin Cities and how it's 
just ever more important to know um, all of, you know, the reasons why things are the way they are today. So uh, I just really enjoyed that process with him. I would have, you know, done it anyway, even if we didn't have a new book coming out, because I just wanted to talk to him and, and hear his story. So I'm, I was just so grateful that he was willing to be involved in that way. Right, right. I was going to, I was going to mention that because for me, um, you know, coming to the book now in the aftermath of the, the George Floyd tragedy, uh, it really struck me, you know, how, how relevant a, a book about the history of, of North Minneapolis and, and sort of the racial, the racial tension um, is really, uh, really relevant, especially in these times. And like you said, you know, having briefly considered an expanded edition, of course, had you gone through with that, that would have been one of the points I'm sure that would have been addressed in an expanded edition and maybe um, a little later we'll talk about, uh, you know, potential for future work you'll be doing, but um, definitely that's a very important piece of Minnesota's history and not, not a very illustrious or beautiful thing to talk about, but very important in the development of you know, and the, the legacy of, of Minneapolis history was this tremendous tragedy, this murder of this man. And it, uh, it weighed heavy on my mind uh, reading the book and, and reading about the, the racial tension and the whole, you know, the, the, the moral squad and all that, all that part and how it, how it worked into it. But, uh, yeah, um, very a very relevant book for for these times and for the the history of Minneapolis overall. But um, and I was I was born at the University of Minnesota Hospital. Uh, both my parents are originally from Southwest Minnesota, small towns. So Minnesota. Minnesota is basically in my blood. I lived in Minnesota um, from the age of six to the age of 18 and then moved out to the Pacific Northwest for about a decade or a little little longer and then uh, came back to the Midwest, lived in South Dakota for a few years, finishing up college. And about five years ago, um, right around the time Prince passed, um, I moved back to Minnesota now I'm in uh, La Center, about an hour from from Minneapolis. I would say, a little a little uh, closer to uh, Chanhassen than that. So I've <laughs> I've been uh, to Paisley Park several times throughout the past five years or so. But um, yeah, I've been a I've been a Prince fan pretty much all my life um, since the age of three was when I really became became a hardcore fan so I've literally grown up with Prince as the soundtrack to my life so reading your book and reading about the you know the origins of Minneapolis soul music and you know the influences and all the all the threads and all the different sounds and and genres that would give birth, give rise to the Minneapolis sound is um, really a special thing for me because not only do I get to see, you know, where, where Prince evolved out of, but also, you know, just reading about my home state and the, the state that's in my heart and in my soul and in my blood. So it's very, very cool to, to read about. But I was also going to ask you a little bit about your phenomenal work for the uh, Official Prince podcast. Um, you not only hosted those episodes, but you also produced them right as well. So um, I just wanted to ask you 
a little bit about your experience with those and and what it was like for you to sort of take a deep dive into you know these albums 1999 and Sign of the Times and sort of you know really take a deep dive into the people and themes and everything else involving these seminal really releases in music history not only Minneapolis history but worldwide history right. and um, so I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your experience uh, producing and hosting those those podcasts I mean it was so rewarding and fulfilling for me it's just been such an incredible experience to be able to get into that much detail and you know I was talking earlier about having this kind of winding path through my career of both writing and audio and it was the first time that I'd really been able to combine all of the skills that I've gathered up throughout my career into one big giant project and that first run you know, exploring 1999, that was actually the first time I'd ever, you know, been a host of a, you know, narrative podcast before. So it was all very new and very intimidating um, being the, you know, guide through something like that. But as soon as I got over that part, <laughs> being a little nervous, um, it just was so fun. I mean, to be able to sit down with someone like Des Dickerson in a studio for 90 minutes and just you know, pick his brain about all of these different things about this period and, and to get to talk to, you know, Wendy and Lisa. Um, I got to interview Lisa twice, actually, um, one for the 1999 one for the sign in the time sign of the times podcast. Um, there's just these highlights that I'm, I'm going to cherish throughout the rest of my professional life, getting to, you know, talk at length with these people that have firsthand knowledge about what Prince was not only doing, but also talking about, um, you know, the ways that he would interact with his bandmates, especially in that early 1999 era, you know, before that album came out to get into the mass disappointment of being booed off stage, opening for the Rolling Stones and to really be able to humanize him in that way and show that even someone as iconic as Prince had these moments of disappointment and struggle and rejection and frustration. And to be able to put that in context with the music that he was making at the time and then what happened after that, um, it's just such a privilege and an honor to get that front row seat, you know, to be able to talk to these people. And, um, yeah, I, I'm, there's not a whole lot else I could say about it. I mean, it's just so, so enjoyable for me. Um, every time that I'm working on one of those podcasts, it feels like my brain is just all lit up because it's so fun. And to listen in such detail to the music and figure out ways to weave in parts of the songs into the storytelling and then write the scripts. And it's just such a such an enjoyable process for me. Well, yeah, I was going to say, you could definitely tell by listening to the podcast, you could tell, you know, of the enthusiasm that you have to tell the story and incorporate the music and interact with all these, you know, luminaries in the Prince world is, you know, the, the enthusiasm and the, the joy that you have is very palpable and it carries through it carries through the speakers, so <laughs> definitely um, phenomenal, phenomenal work on those podcasts. Thank but, you. But, um, yeah, so you left The Current, as you said, in April, and now you're striking out on your own as a freelancer um, without giving too much away or maybe more than you'd like to. Could you tell us um, uh, about some of the plans for maybe your future upcoming work? Sure. Um, well, the thing that I'm really excited about is that I'm able to just take on a lot of different kinds of projects. And 
things that I've been wanting to work on, but just didn't have time. Um, so I have a couple books actually that I'm in, in the process of starting now. Um, one is about one particular figure um, who is mentioned in Got to Be Something Here, um, but that I didn't get a chance to really interview it in the way that I wanted to for the book. And now we've gotten to know each other very well. And he's going to be um, the focus of, of one book that I'm working on. I don't want to give it away quite yet because we're still kind of early in the stages, but I'm really excited about it. And then um, I'm also working on a book that is a broader history in the same um, kind of scope as got to be something here, but more focused on women in the early rock scene in Minnesota, which is another, um, you know, a marginalized group that has not really been properly documented and canonized in the same way as their male peers. Um, and I've done some of the interviews for that and it's so fun. Um, there's so much great early 60s rock music and 70s rock music. Uh, my vinyl collection is growing bigger every day as I research that, um, which is really cool. And then I do have another podcast um, that will be coming out in July. Um, I have to be vague about that at the moment too, but I think we're going to be announcing it in two weeks. So June 24th or so. Okay. So we'll keep a lookout for that. Definitely. And the, uh, the book about about women in, in Minneapolis rock music sounds fascinating to me because much like Prince, I tend to gravitate toward female voices um, more on, you know, in the larger, in the larger scheme of things, I tend to gravitate toward female voices. So that, uh, that book sounds, sounds absolutely fascinating and, the other book sounds great as well. I'd love to to know who the subject of that is, but <laughs> I could be uh, I could be patient with the rest of the rest of the audience. So, but uh, yeah, I definitely look forward to those. And then of course, the podcasts are always tremendous, always worthwhile. And I've got I've got all the episodes saved on my laptop. I <laughs> actually, I actually didn't make it through all of the Son of the Times podcast. I don't know what my problem or my issue was, but I, I never got around to finishing that series. So I've got to pick it back up from the beginning and just go straight through all eight installments. So that's, that was a long one. <laughs> yeah, that's on my to do list. Of course, after I finish, got to be something here. And um, you're also involved, you were interviewed for the the recent um, documentary that came out, the independent documentary, Mr. Nelson on the North Side, which I don't know how many of my audience uh, listen, either listening to the audio of this podcast or watching on YouTube I don't know how many of my audience got a chance to see that. It was sort of a limited engagement thing for this documentary, but uh, the work that they did on on you know on the way and all the the early um, you know music scene at the way and you know in North Minneapolis was very uh, very captivating, and I. I kept that in mind also when I was reading your book. Uh, it fit real well with the the premise of your book as far as illuminating that music scene and, you know, black youth coming up, you know, coming of age, learning music at this important uh, vital institution to North Minneapolis. And that was a very good documentary as well. And I thought your your segments were particularly um, particularly entertaining and, and engaging. So I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, oh, while I thanks. had you here. But um, yeah, I mean, to say I appreciate the work you've done and are doing and will do is a, a massive understatement. And it's a 
it's an honor and a privilege to be able to talk to you today. And um, coincidentally, today, uh, the day we're recording this podcast is June 10th. I might, um, you know, I might uh, be just like I was with the Dwayne Tudal podcast right after we, right after we finished um, talking about his new book, which coincidentally comes out today. Um, the uh, Sun, Parade and Son of the Times Aero Studio Sessions, yes, eighty five and nineteen eighty six. Um, the day, <laughs> as soon as we finished that podcast, I, I went and edited the video and audio and posted it up that very same night. So, so I, I was on the ball there and overly <laughs> excited and chomping at the bit to get it out. So it might be one of those cases again, but, um, anyway, it's June 10th and the book is out now. Um, Andrea, I don't know if you've got a had a chance to read um, portions of that yet or not, but it's a great, great work of of Prince research and scholarship, and it's very, very vital. Um, much like the work you're doing, it's very, very vital to um, promoting and continuing the legacy of, of Prince and uh, I would highly recommend it if, if any of you out there haven't ordered it yet or got a hold of it, I would very much recommend that. I would also recommend picking up either in hardcover or paperback, got to be something here, The Rise of the Minneapolis Sound, and uh, two great books about Minneapolis music. So there you go. Um, <laughs> Andrea, any closing remarks you'd like to make or any uh, topics you'd like to bring up? Um, gosh, I mean, thank you so much for all your kind words about my work. It's, um, it's always a pleasure to stop and think about it for a second because I spend so much time just plowing ahead and going on to the next project and thinking about what I have to do in that day. So I just am so appreciative of you shining a spotlight on me and my work. And I'm really glad that the book has this opportunity to have a little bit of a re revival again. As you said, it, it does feel very relevant to the state of the world right now. And um, I really hope that especially people who live in Minnesota or love Minnesota and want to know more about it can pick up this book and not just learn about the music, but also you know, our, our history, our social history, our political history. And it really helped me through researching and writing it to understand a little bit more in the nuanced way, how we got to where we are today. And some of these cyclical patterns that people are really trying to break at the moment with um, protest and with, you know, lobbying for new policies and new ways of being um, new police efforts, new new ways that we could organize our society. Um, it's a really tense, but also a really hopeful time um, to be in Minnesota as people look to the future and figure out where we go from here. So if you want to know more about, you know, what happened in the 60s and some of the parallels between the unrest that happened then and, and what's happened in the last year, um, the book is a good starting place. There's lots of other great resources, of course. Um, TPT's put out some great documentaries over the years about um, Ron both Rondo and North Minneapolis, and there's a lot of great resources that are linked at the end of my book um, in the glossary, and um, you can check out some more of those resources too. But I like to say, you know, music is a fun lens <laughs> through which to view some, you know, hard, dark topics, um, and it's hopefully you know, a quicker read, uh, uh, something that you can consume in not too many sittings and come away, you know, having that deeper understanding of our society and, and here in Minnesota. Very, very cool. And yes, I wanted to, I wanted to mention, uh, you mentioned it right as I was thinking it, but the, the glossary and the index and all that stuff in your, at the end of your book, and also the 
the list of various compilations and various music releases that you can get that um, cover the the era that you cover in the book. Um, it's very interesting to me. And after reading after reading the book, I'm definitely going to look into actually hearing some of this music because the way the way you write about it and the words you use and the descriptions and everything, it really, um, it's really vivid and, and really gets you into my, it's almost as if you can hear the music uh, through reading the words on the page. So it's really, really cool. Um, but of course, you know, I'd like to hear the music, you know, <laughs> for myself and, and see if it matches up with what I have in my head, reading, <laughs> reading, reading your descriptions. But um, yeah. Just, well, I do have a, I made a playlist on my YouTube page. Um, I can send you a link. It's a lot of the music that's talked about in the book. Um, some For some reason, YouTube seems to be the place to go find all these out of print 45s because people will upload them there. Excellent. Excellent. And I'll, I'll definitely include that in the, down in the description box for this YouTube video as well. I'll include the link to the playlist and also the link to um, purchase Andrea's book, Got to Be Something Here, Rise of the Minneapolis Sound. So, Andrea, thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, I look forward to your, your future work, which I'm sure is going to be tremendous. And I hope we can keep in touch. And um, I actually, I actually uh, had my copy of your book signed by you. You were very pregnant at the time, I remember. <laughs> um, it was at the University of Minnesota campus. Uh, I had participated in the Prince from Minneapolis Symposium. I gave a talk on, on uh, the theme of end times in Prince's 1999 and Purple Rain albums at the symposium there and you were signing books then and so I got I got my copy signed by you and uh, very grateful for that but thank you so much for for joining me today and and like I say I look forward to keeping in touch and good luck on all your future endeavors. Thank you so much, Chris. Yeah, definitely keep in touch. And it was just a total pleasure talking to you today. Thanks for having me. Well, it, the the, uh, the pleasure is all mine, really. Um, but until next time, this is Chris Johnson. And for myself and Andrea Swinson, I'd like to say thank you. And we'll see you next time on the Purple Nights podcast. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>